our guests. Thank you all again for coming. I'm going to do a short introduction. Um, we have uh, Alex Mitchell here from IAD99. We've got Utsava Kassira, who's an investor and has just recently started a high-end Prosecco company, which I'm looking forward to sampling later. <laughs> uh, uh, we've got Andy Fern, who's co-founder of Protection Approaches, and uh, Nicole Prostorius, who has a double set up. So uh, she can code Hatch and Advance are all yours, which is brilliant. So I think we've got some really interesting things to talk about today. So first off, we're going to do some quick, just who are they and, and a little bit about their company. We've just been debating who gets to start first. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> so yeah, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for having us. Um, and it's great to celebrate your achievements tonight. Um, so I'm Nicole. Um, I started She Can Code three or four years ago, um, and it's a social enterprise with the mission to bridge the gender divide um, through teaching women how to code and working with tech companies to help bring more inclusion. So I, yeah. <laughs> um, from there, I joined um, Advance as a co-founder, and Advance is a. Uh, an AI-driven career discovery platform for graduates where they can find careers that are suited to them and we match them directly to employers so they can get hired through a platform. Um, yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> perfect, thank you. Should I go? Yeah, perfect. Uh, hi guys, uh, yes, just to echo the words that I'm, I'm really honoured to have been invited to chat to everyone and hope uh, that I'll be able to give you a few bits of interest from, from kind of my experience of setting something up. Um, yeah, I'm co-founder of a non-profit uh, called Protection Approaches. We work to prevent all identity-based violence. So any act of violence perpetrated because of someone's race, religion, gender, ethnicity, political affiliation, uh, the list can go on. It's sort of anything in the eyes of the, the perpetrator. Um, and it can stem from hate crime and violent extremism uh, in the UK to, to genocide and mass atrocities around the world. Um, so a huge mandate we've given ourselves, um, but a lot of our work is really about bringing evidence to policymakers, so helping them to understand what they could be doing locally in the UK or globally to try and tackle this challenge. Um, and so in the last four years, we've grown from uh, myself and the other co-founder, sort of working part-time, um, while also sort of going back to work in bars and things while we were setting it up through to having six full-time members of staff now and, and sort of growing all the time. Um, so I'll talk much more about sort of the things we're doing as time goes on, I'm sure. But that's, that's all from me for now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Utsava, and uh, thank you for having me. I started my career back about 10 years back in the detergent industry, where my which was my family business of creating chemicals. And I worked about five, six years, and we were quite successful from starting from one office in India to making few offices around the globe. And uh, afterwards, I got bored and I wanted new ventures. So I started investing and uh, kind of starting new ventures in terms of luxury wines, and I started a private members club in Singapore also. And recently, I've launched a Prosecco brand two years back in, in the UK and Singapore, which I'm focusing on because I think that there's a big, big market around the world for this, but there is no brand as such associated with Prosecco. And uh, we'll talk more about this once, once we get there. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Alex. My background is as a business lobbyist. But I quit that area, and if you want to go on to why I quit that, I'm happy to tell you that later on. Um, but I set up a sort of think and do tank about six, seven years ago now called Kulzama. Um, I also set up a charity about seven years ago called Kit Us Out, and we support disabled athletes, primarily in developing nations. And we've given out about 30,000 items of kit to athletes and teams in 64 countries across the globe. And um, I run, or I set up, and currently chair. UK's fastest growing network for high growth entrepreneurs called the ID99, which is part of the Institute of Directors organisation. But um, look forward to some great questions and also an awesome panel. So look forward to hearing what the rest of the panel have to say. If you want to talk about Brexit, I mean, I've been told to do quite a lot. So um, do grab me afterwards. And if you look at my Twitter stream, you can see that I get fairly ranty about it as well. We, we might actually lose him at some point during the session because he might have to run off and do some more um, lib deming. Yeah. 
which is, which is um, news if you're following us. So um, I just want to say we've got a really wide range of sectors and experiences at our table, which is very interesting and it's a great panel to have together. But one thing that is um, quite often the instigating question is why did you choose to become an entrepreneur? We were talking earlier about you know, the, the students in many countries are, I need to go and get a job and that, that job is with government and it's high profile. But actually what, what led you down the entrepreneur path? I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, if I'm absolutely honest, I didn't really think, I never, I never set out thinking I was going to start something myself. It wasn't, it wasn't something that uh, I had in like a career plan and thought, you know what, this is, this is what I'm going to be about. Um, for me, it was, it was that there was something missing and no one else was filling that, that space. And I kind of felt, look, well, if no one else is going to, then, then it kind of has to be me. Um, you know, a, a very quick background, I won't go too into it. I mean, I was working in the world of genocide prevention um, and working in sub-Saharan Africa on peace building programs um, and became really frustrated that, that these peace building programs, programs that looked at, um, you know, how we can have uh, better debate without, or conflict without it being, like, how we can have better positive conflict. Um, how communities can be brought together better, how young people can lead on bringing communities together. And this was all something that we should thought that we should be doing elsewhere in the world and not like at home in our own countries because of course the UK and Western democracies are completely immune to these problems now. We're, we're, we're in a much better position. Uh, and we've seen over the last few years how, how wrong we were and that actually as our kind of uh, country feels like it's falling apart a bit, uh, more and more, we're looking at how we can do these programmes at home. And so we really wanted just to come up with a way of, of bringing some of those programmes that happen overseas to the UK and changing the way we think about these issues in the UK. So it was really about, like, there is a problem that we need to solve and we need to go about doing it. Yeah. And I guess, like, the only other things um, that then made me feel we could do it is probably, like, some arrogance and self-belief I think you probably need to have some belief that you're in your own ability to, to do things. Um, it certainly wasn't for kind of the, the money or for an easy life, because I can promise you it's been incredibly difficult and, and uh, not the most financially beneficial thing in the world. Um, and the final thing I guess I'll say just about kind of me becoming an entrepreneur um, is like a lot of it is to do with, with privilege as well, right? Like I think... For me, I'm able to make that decision, or I was able to make the decision to take that risk because I'm from a position whereby even if everything went completely wrong, I knew I wouldn't end up with nothing. I knew that I had support networks in place. I had family, uh, friends who would never let me end up on the streets or without the ability to feed myself or whatever it is. And lots of people don't have that. Lots of people don't have the ability to take a risk because they have a support network for themselves. Um, and I just mentioned that because I think it's something that's worth us always remembering. And especially if we do really well, like how do we then help others um, without the same privilege or, or, or situation as we started in to be able to do the same? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's weird. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and so, so like that... that the gap, I suppose it is the gap in the market, no one else is filling mm. it, and that need and almost desire and urge that it, if no mm -hmm. one else is doing it, it has to be me. And, and I saw you nodding yeah. at that as well, so I, I feel that that's where. Yeah, so my career, um, well, I actually wanted to go, I wanted to work for a big bank um, and um, had a really terrible recruitment experience, actually, and withdrew and then had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, graduated and sort of felt a bit purposeless, to be honest. Um, took the first job that I was offered and ended up in tech recruitment. And then um, from there, I you know, was suddenly faced with similar working with women who had felt exactly how I'd felt in my sort of interview experiences. And I felt that I was suddenly in the position of power and I really saw the divide. I mean, for every 20 profiles that were men there was one woman that we was putting forward you know and there was a lot of a lot of stories were being shared 
with me and I felt that women were quite open and vulnerable with me and the sort of you know it, it all started organically I didn't set out to start a business we started a blog we started sharing stories we started sharing resources it grew into a community of seven eight thousand women within a year it was really quickly um, and we started running events and you know it was just this thing and then all of a sudden I said well I was very lucky to have directors of the recruitment agency who when I tried to resign said we love what this is and we see a business opportunity here and we see how we can make it a sustainable sort of social enterprise and why don't we set this up as its own organization and you know we can drive this forward because a lot of our clients at that point started turning around and saying actually you know we'd love more women in our company and we're open to that how can we do that can we survey the women in your community can you can come consult with us can we um, you know come to your events and market our companies there and so it turned quite organically into a business. I didn't really set out to start it. So again, gap in the market, position of support and privilege. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, the, the second business sort of, you know, it was, it's quite related. Advance is very much solving a similar problem. And I guess you sort of build expertise and intuition and sort of um, industry experience within something that opens your mind up to all the other issues and problems that you could solve there, and so that was somewhat organic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And and, I, and I'm just I'm going to lead this way yeah. because from <laughs> something that you said earlier in your little introduction was that so you you've come from a family background yes. of, of enterprise. Yes. And and at one point you got bored. Yes. Tell, tell me more. Did that, <laughs> did that drive you forward hard? Yes, it did. Because I constantly need thrill in my life. And I was kind of thinking that, okay, we have gone from A to B already. And my business was already running in kind of autopilot mode. And I, I like creating new things. Yeah. And uh, again, what Andy said, that what was missing in the market, and I could find a way to create and help in, in my small way and this is how it this was one big thing and the other thing was like since I was young I was always looking upon I grew up in a fam family business so I was always looking upon my father as a role model and uh, when I was young I was collecting I was I had a hobby of collecting stamps but I did not have enough pocket money to do that so I had to find innovative ways to do that like to fund s some of those hobbies and uh, one thing was when I was growing up in India, that time it was a quota system in the country and a lot of things were quite difficult to get. But my dad was traveling abroad a lot and he was getting Tintin comics. And I started a small library by renting out those comics and uh, earning some money for that. So that was my first kind of experience and also a lesson in, basic lesson in demand and supply. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I had the same thing. I think yeah. role models are, is a good point there. Yeah. My dad is also my role model. Yeah. And he used to travel to America. And you know we were post-apartheid South Africa at the time. We had no exposure to lip smackers and Jolly Ranchers. Oh, yeah. And he would travel and come back. And I would stand at school and sell, yeah. sell lip smackers and Jolly Ranchers to everyone. And then use the money to go and buy more. You know, so and give it back to him. And he was very strict with me on you know, the economics of it. So... I think it's having um, the opportunity to play, you know, to learn those things and then having role models exactly. who sort of mentor and guide you into it. Yeah. And being an entrepreneur, I think, also brings a flexibility which probably a corporate job cannot that easy. So I, I enjoy that kind of flexibility in, in doing things. Right. So. I think flexibility, but along with a much bigger responsibility. Of course. Of which course, is which yeah. is always an interesting point when we're trying to encourage some of our graduates to become entrepreneurs yeah. rather than to go and get the day job because yeah. at the day job you'll be doing your day job as an entrepreneur and you have to know everything. Yeah. Do you tell tell me why you became? Um, well, it sort of picks up on some of the points mentioned earlier. Firstly, like you accidentally end up in it. So on the charity side. I never thought I'd set up a charity, and if anyone's thinking of setting up a charity, it's really <laughs> bloody difficult. But um, right. with, with Kit Us Out, um, it was, I was a volunteer during the London Olympics and Paralympics, because it was in my home city and wanted to be a part of it, and met some athletes from the Cote d'Ivoire, 
who had their legs blown off due to, or had their arms blown off due to landmines, or one due to a landmine, one due to a gunshot wound, due to civil war then. And um, they didn't have any running shoes, running spikes, so we, my wife and I bought them a pair of running spikes. Um, it grew from there during the London Paralympics, and during then we gave out about 60 items of kit, or bought 60 items of kit for um, athletes from 16 different countries. And it was the end of that that was seriously inspirational, like again, like outside people influencing. Firstly, it was, I never realised this was an issue. And then talk about sort of conflict in a positive way, the role that sport can play in uh, breaking down barriers and enhancing participation, community participation. You're starting to see a lot of work being done on that now, like the Mayor of London's focus uh, on Sport Unites that's doing that. Um, and there's this amazing lady called Baroness Tammy Gray Thompson, who turned around and I was giving a, an interview on BBC at the end of the Paralympics, and afterwards she took me aside and said, what are you gonna do now? And I said, well, it was interesting, but I don't know. And she goes, well, I think you should take it forward and set up a charity and do it. So is that sort of, A, not realising it was ever going to be, randomly happen, B, realising there was actually a gap here that needed, um, something that needed to be met, and um, C, that sort of inspirational figure to turn around and say, look, pull your finger out and do it. You realise there's a problem here, sort it out. And uh, for the business, the reason for starting on my own there, it was simple. My, um, I won't tell you who, but my final boss in, in work was a right fucking shit, to be honest, who was horrible, like misogynistic, sexist, racist, the whole, all the baddists in society, he was that. And I mean, I came away from that, I think I'm never gonna have another boss like that. Well, never say never, like, <laughs> someone wants to offer me an amazing yeah. salary to do whatever I want to do, really. But yeah, he was, yeah, he was a real, real piece of work. And uh, came away and that's why I set up my other company. Brilliant. And I'm very aware that there's a running thread going through of this like, social impact and, mm. and our give back to our societies and, and, and the world around us, not just our direct community. How important was that to your, the development of the, like, the shape of your business? Did you, did you use that specifically to set, so you set up a charity? Was it always going to be a charity? Um, or was that the, it's a charity, you didn't look any further type thing? You know, how um, much was it informed? I think it was, for me, it was completely uninformed. I didn't realise there was a kit requirement. I didn't even think about, you know, if you're competing for your country, regardless of if you're for Timor Leste or France, you'd expect to have kit. But especially within disability sport, let alone in body sport, within disability sport, there is no kit. Like for a lot of the developing teams, absolutely nothing. And from a charity perspective, it was, it was sort of like, it took about nine months to set it up and to understand that journey that we were going on and that's where it was going to go. Um, because we just, it was constantly questioning myself, like I'm not an athlete, I'm not, I don't have a disability, I come from a privileged white background from a, one of the richest countries in the world. I didn't, you know, what, what gives me the right to talk to other people about disability sport? And I was very aware as soon as there was a lot of media attention and there still is around the charity. And I'm constantly aware that I'm speaking about an issue which I have no impact on. So it's that there was a lot of questioning myself. Do I have a right to be in this space? Do I have a right to be? And it was uh, Tani, Tani who turned around and said, look, you are providing a solution here. Like, kind of buck up. Sort it out. You know, you've got an opportunity here to do something. Pull in the right people. Don't be afraid. Don't be worried about it. But it was really a, like even now with Kit Us Out, we don't know kind of what we're doing. We've just signed a, par uh, signed a partnership with Team England and the Paralympic Committee and numerous other different UEFA and football bodies and this sort of stuff. And it's kind of like just my wife and I running it in our spare time on weekends. And it's like, we've got, I mean, Christ knows the insurance company, I'm glad they don't know, but hundreds and hundreds of thousand pounds worth of kit just sitting in our loft and sitting in every yeah. spare room in our house. It is properly weird. And you go on, you say, oh, it's amazing. And you're seeing all this stuff going all over. And it's like, yeah, but there is no structure to it. There is. And even with the business, like, you know, on the business side, is it a structure process? Not really, because I went down that, we were talking about it earlier, about there's a big sort of, in my view, in the startup scene in the UK, and I do a bit with the G20 Entrepreneurs Alliance and helped set that up about 11 years ago. And there's this sort of real keeping up with the Joneses thing, which you've got to be really careful about, of how you benchmark success. Like, is it how much money you've raised, how, how the square footage of your office, how many staff you've got? And for me, I am useless at recruiting people. Really, really poor at recruiting people. And have a nightmare with that side of things. And grew the business that way and realised I've recruited the wrong people. And the business is failing because of it. So I had to revert 
sort of pivot the business model around to look at a more sort of contractor based model and your margins are less but like people are saying you know look, know your money that's so important with business know your finances so you take less of a margin but you're able to scale up and scale down far far quicker and from the line of business assignment it means we work on projects so i can scale the business up quickly for different projects and scale it back down for different projects I have the right skill set in the business at the right time and for my business model that works for a lot it wouldn't yeah. uh, it's, yeah. So, 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 so then, no, that's it's what we want. So, but flexibility in your business is vital. And and having it was Tammy who said that kind of encouraged you to start this. Yeah, from from the charity, yeah. it was Tiny Gray Thompson, who's if anyone knows her, she's like one of the world's most famous Paralympian athletes. Um, I think she's the most successful yeah. one in the UK. A um, wheelchair racer, amazing, seriously amazing, influential uh, influential individual. She sits in the House of Lords and does all this sort of stuff, like loads and loads of good things, but it was her sort of challenge to turn around and go, this is an issue. Like, there's uh, no I'm, ju I'm just going to pull, pull that kind of line of conversation out a little bit more because you, you both talked about your role models as well. And, and so I'm presuming that Tanya is like a, an absolute inspiration. Yeah, that totally, gave you yeah. that vision or the confidence in yourself to go and do it. Yeah, because she was really blonde. She was, I didn't know her before. And she just took me aside. I never met her apart from knowing her and... Like we were on a panel together on BBC Breakfast, on the sofa together there, and afterwards she said, oh, let me just have a chat with you afterwards. And she pulled me aside and said, what are you going to do now? And I said, well, it's probably yeah. wind up. It's been good, it's been fun, it's been interesting. And she said, don't do that. She's going, sort it out. You've got an opportunity. There's a real problem here. No one else is doing it. The big sports brands don't care. Um, no, I shouldn't really say that, but because some of them get kicked out. Um, uh, but at the time, they didn't care. It's for like that. And yeah. sort it out. Yeah, yeah, so it's that sort of but a blunt challenge, like we are talking about it before, but that's kind of like a mental yeah. kind of role as well, and to say that. And how through. important is that mentorship in, in all of your businesses? I'm going to come to you. Yeah. Right. Um, so, again, my role model, which was my father in the beginning, he was kind of a mentor to me as well, because he was giving me advices since I was 10, 11, whatever, and um, he kind of paved the way for me in a way to be an entrepreneur. And then secondly, I started reading a lot because of him with, about entrepreneurship. And I saw that some of the lessons actually could be applied, yes, but some of them, they are very, very specific to those particular people. Because entrepreneurship is not just about um, business theories, I think. It is more about mm -hmm. practice and practicalities on the ground. <laughs> and this is, this is what I learned that. A, what works for you, not just this is the answer to everything. And in terms of, I mean, I had no other mentor apart from him, and I just learned things on the road by myself, mm. more or less. So, yeah, that's all. I'd like to meet your dad. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I've got you too. Um, I, think, I think it's like you have inspiration or you have sort of like an inherent... That you said, you know, what about social impact? And I think for me, a lot about it was growing up in this sort of very uh, apartheid where it's like, you know, extreme differences between wealth and poor, you know, the wealthy and the poor, and being sort of faced with that. At school, we had really good groundings where, you know, the motto was making a world of difference, and we did ch charity work every single week. We were required to do three hours a week. Um, so I was exposed to a lot of that I think growing up and I think that sort of instilled in me a need to be you know someone who does good for the world and that makes me happy and that brings me joy so that's the social impact part of it and especially when you can relate to it you feel purpose and I think that's important and then role models are there to sort of guide you along the way and I've had many along the way um, you know anyone can be a role model and I think that was one of the things that we tried to talk about at She Can Code was that you know, you don't necessarily need to look at the Martha Lane forces <coughs> of the world and all aspire to be, you know, the Shell Sandbergs and the, you know, the crazy ambitious CEOs of huge tech companies. You can also look at, you know, 23 year old Maria who, you know, studied art and then did a course on her own after hours and is now doing her dream job and that's super inspirational and I think what we try to do is share more everyday role models and try and show people that anyone can
can be that you don't need to come from a pri privileged background, you don't need to come from, you know, the perfect education or an Oxbridge school. Um, you can do what you want to do, you just have to set your mind to it. Um, that's my take on role models, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, I, yeah, I've just been thinking about it. I can't. I don't think there is anyone that I would say is a traditional like role model or mentor. But and like I feel like we should turn the camera off because if she ever hears me say this, I'll never live it down. No, but the 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 the, the, my, the other co-founder of Protection Approaches, who I set up with, Kate. Like it would have been impossible to do anything without her and. We are so different as people, mm. uh, and I think she would agree that that you know I might want to run ahead and do something while she might be more cautious, and and sometimes I might and sometimes she is. But normally, actually, we meet in the middle, and we do probably just about the right thing because we've met in the middle, and sometimes we argue like mad over a strategy or what we're going to do next. But like. I just don't think it would be possible without there being two of us. And I would say to anyone, actually, if you're setting something up, like, like I'd really think about having someone else there with you because it can get pretty dark and hard at times. Mm. And you can not know what to do and you can be thinking to yourself, like, am I right making the right decisions here? And having someone you can talk to about that and talk it through and sometimes you're the strong one and sometimes the other person's the strong one uh, is, just, is just so beneficial. And, and one other thought I was thinking on, like role models or mentors or whatever, and it's kind of touched on some of what you were saying, like, I, I, it might sound a bit cocky, but I do think sometimes as well, like, like, it's okay to think we don't have to follow the way someone, it was done before us. Like, there's a reason that you think you're doing something different, and actually it's really good to do things different. And particularly, like, so in the, the charity world, like, if it was done right before, the problem would have been solved. And so it's kind of okay to be like, do you know what, I'm gonna try different things and not follow the way that the generation before me did it. Um, and that's a lot of what we, we try and do in our work, I think. Mm -hmm. There's so many bits that I want to talk about. <laughs> where, where do we start? I, I want to come back to that, that you made a, a comment just about the, some of the darkest moments. Because I think that for every single entrepreneur, how many entrepreneurs are in the room from our audience? Not, not, you. Not, you, you lot should be like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so not a lot. So, so actually it's quite interesting. Go, if, you, if you know an entrepreneur, go and find one that's been through the, those really dark moments because I think we, we touched on this earlier in a, a conversation. That mental resilience, that, that mental strength to be able to get through those moments when you're... Yeah. You know, it's crumbling around your ears and I'm I'm seeing around our little <laughs> table the nodding heads. Do we do we want to talk about that? Yeah sure. Yeah. I think there's like extreme highs and extreme lows and I think having a partner like you said is key and also more than that having a partner who shares your vision and has the same purpose is the most important. I think um, you know part of the reason why I've sort of moved fully into advance and semi away from Sheik and Code is that the vision with my co-founders was separate, you know, it was going in separate directions and, you know, it's not a bad thing. We still all get along. We all still support the purpose of the business, but the alignment wasn't there anymore and it's okay to admit it and it's okay to say that, you know, that isn't there anymore rather than trying to fight to, to find that, you know, sort of shared vision, rather accept that that isn't there and, you know, move on. And I think it can be very dark, but you need, yeah, with Advance, I'm very lucky that I have co-founders who, you know, we're, we're all going down together, <laughs> you know, and we all stay late till 1 a.m. working, get up again at 6 a.m., like it's crazy hours, not all the time, but it is, at times, it can be crazy. Um, at times, it's not, and, you know, at times you kind of walk into the office a million things have gone wrong that morning and then you see someone having a bike accident and then you walk into the office you realise you forgot your laptop charger at home. You just kind of burst into tears, you know, and you just need your partner there to say, it's okay, I've got it, go home. You know, you need a tag team in and out and I think that's why it's important because if you didn't have them, who's going to do the stuff that you need to get done, you know, and how can you cope and build that resilience, so... I think that, that resilience piece yeah. is 
I think, key to any business entrepreneur going through the startup or even the growth phase. But um, keep keen to hear. Yeah. So I, both of you are. I, I think it's like you know the the, me- the, the the sort of the mental health aspect is crucial, and it's it's really difficult. It really difficult. Like, you know, there are plenty more downs than there are ups sometimes, and a down can come time and time and time again. And I remember one of my friends turning, a uh, mentor turning around to me in the early days, one of them, and saying, look, you know, celebrate every success at least once a week. No matter how crap your week, like he used to call it Crunchy Friday, and it's like, on Friday, get a chocolate bar and just pick out one success and celebrate that. And that is just, you've got to be, you've got to find that one thing. I think, well, I don't have a co-founder with my business, but my, my wife is amazing and very much acts like that. So when you can be open and honest with, and sometimes I haven't been open and honest, it's led to massive conflict and it's led to massive internalization and all the problems that go with it. But like, like having, having that group around you is so important. You've got to have honesty within that group. Like before I was doing this panel, I was looking at the other three on the panel and thought, oh, what are they going to be like? And, well, and then we literally sat down next door and we had a quick chat, like literally for five minutes, and this is all it takes. And I know that I could now pick up the phone to any one of them and say, look, I've had a really crap day. And I know that they go, yeah, don't worry, I've had a similar day, it's been fine. We've never met before, but you can just feel it with a group of individuals. And it is about that honesty. If someone turns around to you and says, oh, it's all amazing, it's all a great, and taking selfies in front of private jets and Bentleys, <laughs> it's amazing. Don't trust them. Like, they're not going to be there for you. Like, maybe they are incredible. So maybe that's sort of once in a million people that do it. But having that open and honesty with a co-founder or with a group around you or with a peer network or with a group of people you just get on with, who can just be there at the end of the phone, at the end of a direct message on Twitter or at the end of WhatsApp and just go, yeah, don't worry, I've, I've been through that and it isn't all about success is, for me, absolutely fundamental. What I look for in any community, big or small, you've got to have that honesty, you've got to have that openness, and be willing to share those failures. It doesn't all go right. We all make basic, basic mistakes. And it might, to someone else, it might seem, wow, what an idiot, why did Alex do that? Like, for me, when I started out, I didn't pay my tax for the first six months, and then we made, I made 864 quid. And it's, ah, HMRC, don't care about that, why should I declare it? So I didn't declare it, right? Forgetting the fact that my salary beforehand had put me over the track fresher. So a year later, I got a bill for about 1,400 quid. So like, if you want someone on finance, I'm not your person on finance. But you make mistakes. Even the most basic, the fundamental areas, you make mistakes. And I'm sure all of us around this table have made similar mistakes, and we're going to keep making mistakes as well. But to be open and honest and share with them, and have a, like, having that group around you, willing to be open and honest, is crucial my view to pick yourself up on those days which are crappy days and it could just be five minutes you could just be like you forgot your charger or oh, yeah. i forgot my charge card to get on the my oyster card and it's like oh this is just going to be one of those days and you're yeah. just sitting there at the tube station you go, oh how am i going to get through today it could just be tiny little things but then you can pick yourself up afterwards but sometimes you need those people you're just going to go, don't worry it's fine we've all been there it's okay okay so so i'm keen to to expand that because I think having that community of support around you, you know, you were talking earlier about having that, that support of family and friends mm-hmm. that enables you to become an entrepreneur and to start up. Have you rebuilt a new community around yourself of other entrepreneurs? Uh, maybe not of other entrepreneurs, but certainly of like, I think there's a bit you were saying about making a mistake and not having done your tax and things that made me really think of like, you're right, we do all make so many mistakes and some of that's because you're meant to be an expert in everything. And, and you can't be, like, I, I'm meant to know, like, so now we've got you know, six members of staff and it's great, but I have to, because we don't have huge resources, I have to know HR. Like, I still deal, although we've now got an accountant, fantastic, they're like a remote accountant, so I deal with the accounts in house. And there's like, like all these laws and stuff that I didn't know existed before. And like, it goes on and on. The, the expertise that you suddenly realize you're supposed to have to be able to run something that you just thought of as like, oh, if you did this, it would fill that little gap that doesn't exist, and all of a sudden you have to know a thousand things you didn't even consider you'd ever ever get involved in in your life because maybe you've worked at a company beforehand and actually they've got teams in place to do all these bits and pieces so you can just do your job. Um, so the community we've more built is actually like a support network around that. Like it's it's okay. Like we've met people who know HR, 
and are willing to be on the end of the phone when we have a problem or, or just even uh, a new starter when we need to know like what, what, what systems to go through, who can talk us through that. We have um, you know, a great group of trustees that, that help with, with oversight and uh, you know, so one of them helps me on, on account stuff a bit and things like that. So like, I'd say that the network has grown really in terms of um, like supporting all the things we, we didn't understand before. And then we work really collaboratively, so there's loads of charities and organisations that work in a similar field that we spend loads of time with. We go, we, just the other night we were at um, the Mass Atrocity Prevention Network Drinks, uh, where everyone that works in Mass Atrocity Prevention in the UK goes and has drinks together and, and as you can imagine, a lot of very fun chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a light either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And have you done similar, have you built up that? kind of resource support network yeah, as well. Yeah, I think that there are there is a lot of support in the UK. You just have to seek it out, I think. And and you'll get various bits and pieces from different communities. So I know on Slack there's I'm part of two or three different founder communities where we share resources and you can try out people's free software, you know, demo for them and you can ask people to complete a survey or, you know, whatever it is. I think and then you know, closer to home, you'll have that emotional support and closer within your organization. There is a lot of support out there. And also, don't be afraid to ask people for help because I've done that so many times and some of the best support I've received is literally finding someone on LinkedIn and going, hey, you have knowledge on something I don't that I could really leverage from. Could I please have 10 minutes of your time? I'd love to buy you a coffee. Almost no one has said no, you know. Everyone wants to help. And if someone asked me, I'd say, I, I have a call scheduled at 11 tomorrow with, you know, someone in South Africa who wants just some advice, you know. And you, you, when you get time, you give time. And I think that there is a lot of camaraderie and support. You just have to ask. You can't isolate yourself. Yeah. So, yes. And uh, this is something which uh, I did in Singapore with my private members club, which was focusing mostly around social entrepreneurship. And every week we had one day where someone would come and tell their problems or what they are facing in the business. And then other people would try to give their solutions. And that was so successful because First of all, you will get to know new, new things and new problems, and then you would get help from various different people. And we did not expect it to be so successful in the beginning. And then all the all the events were just completely sold out for because uh, you would get so much valuable advice from people who have been through this in the past. So yeah, the the beam there done it, and I yes. got the t-shirts. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a cu couple of questions, and I know that we're, we're kind of extending our session because we had a later coffee break, but um, to bring it back into the creative spark mode, which is you know, why everyone's here, we've been talking a lot about you know, teaching entrepreneurship in the creative economy and, and for creative businesses, and, and I know that not all of your businesses stem from the creative sector, but has creativity helped your business? And, and how have you perhaps implemented that into your business? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I'd say so much. I mean, you'd probably call, say that we were like social entrepreneurs, but I think like everything we do is about creativity. Like we, many of our programs are around, you know, what can we do different in schools to, to help people come out of schools more resilient against fake news and prejudice and things like that. It's, it's how can we support marginalised communities to have greater voice um, and be able to advocate more for themselves? And all of those things are like things we have to develop, ideas we have to have and put into to practice and, and capture the evidence of what works from that. So it's, it's all about being creative. I guess the thing I'd say about the being creative, though, is like... I guess sometimes we think of like being creative or... or, or Creative nurse is its own thing. Like that as long as you, as long as you're a creative person, you can go and do something. And I guess like for us, it's really founded in expertise and knowledge. Like I can only come up with that idea of what to do if I know everything possible about what's been tried before, um, 
the community that I'm going to be working with, um, the, the, the reasons we're trying to do something, what we want the outcome to be, and then you can have the creative idea that's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I guess that's, I always think of it as, like, the creative stuff is the idea that comes out of the expertise that has taken a long time and a lot of research and a lot of understanding to, to get to that point. Yeah, knowing how things are so mm. that you can see them differently. Yeah. yeah. I think also uh, creativity, I mean, we, we get really creative because when you're a startup, you don't have much money. Um, so, you, you know, you yeah. try and find ways to get anything for nothing, and that makes you really super creative. <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking about tax. I just mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just mean like anything, you know. Um, you, you don't have a marketing budget, so how are you going to get the word out, you know? So how can we get people to talk about what we're doing rather than us having to pay to talk about it, you know? Uh, and every little thing that you do costs money, so how can we not spend that money and be as lean as possible? I think that's where a lot of creativity mm. comes in and it makes you start thinking about how you can have full cycles, you know, rather than, oh, we'll come this far and then pay our way to get the rest. You know, you try and think, well, this will benefit them, so they have an interest in this. It's like thinking about the stakeholders um, and who's involved so that, you know, you can try and... Everyone's winning, basically. You try and think of, you know, models that are... that feed into one another so that, you know, that, well, that, that person wants this, so we'll give them this and they'll give us that and then we'll go to them with that and you do a lot of almost bartering, you know, in a sense. Um, to, to get further. <laughs> I think that, that gets, you would never do that in a big organization where they go, your budget's 10 grand and you spend on what you want and you just assess the different solutions. You go, we'll go for that one, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't even have a budget. You would never do that in a startup. So I think it makes you think, oh, well, this costs us a lot of money. Is there a way we can build this? So that, uh, an example at Advance, we built an aggregator to scrape all the jobs in this graduate um, market into our page, most organizations just go, well, let's just buy a white label job board, you know, and that, but we looked at that and said, we can't afford that, so let's build our own, you know, so you start thinking about how would I build that, and then that sparks the creativity. Um, and coming back to the first thing which we discussed was uh, finding out what is missing in the market and then how we can do something to solve that problem. So I'll give you a small example about my Prosecco. We, we went to Italy with, with my partners and we found out that, well, first of all, in that region, just the Prosecco was being just sold everywhere they could sell because it was just booming as a market and no one was caring about creating a brand. And how do we do that? So we thought that we need a beautiful story around that by combining history, because Prosecco is a very historical, like since 200 years they have been growing grapes in that region. And uh, it's similar to Champagne in terms of the area which has been defined and you can't call it a Prosecco and not many people know about that. And then we decided that to give it a name called Ombra, which means shadow in Latin. And uh, the whole story goes that in olden times, when there was no refrigerators, the traders used to sell Prosecco in, in following the shadow of the tower in Italy, in, in St. Mark's Square and around that. And even today, if you go to Italy and ask for Ombra, it means Prosecco. So that's why we named it and it, it's doing very well because there's a beautiful story around that. So that's also very unique about uh, how you do branding. Absolutely. I think that storytelling is a massive mm. yeah. piece. That, you know, all of you have amazing stories of, yeah. of how you've developed your enterprises and your experiences over the years. And I think that's vital to the, the lifeblood of your businesses as well. Mm -hmm. any, any entrepreneur that's had to buy a, a website or build a website and, you know, the URL, yeah. that's where your first <laughs> point of creativity yeah. comes yeah, in yeah, because yeah. almost every yeah. domain name yeah. is bought. So <laughs> you've got to get really crafty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm going to pause.